Your Excellency, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to this COFAS Country Risk Seminar. As you may know, COFAS has been underwriting commercial and political risk for now seven decades. And to be more efficient in what we do, we have established our own offices in 67 countries and we can offer our services in 100 countries through partners. Uh, we were the first trade credit insurance company to set up an office in Singapore. This was way back in 1994. We also are the lead underwriters in the loan insurance scheme, which is sponsored by uh, IE Singapore. Over the years, what we've learned is that for a company to be truly successful and uh, profitable, it needs to have total control on all its risks, uh, including the risks that we underwrite. And hence, we organize these risk seminars. Uh, we've been doing this from 1996 uh, in 2017. This is our 19th risk seminar. The last was held in uh, Tokyo the day before yesterday. So to hear from the experts, I would like to invite Glenda Chong, who's our moderator for this afternoon. Glenda is a presenter and executive director of international news at Channel News Asia. She currently anchors Primetime World and is a co-host of Primetime Asia. Glenda. Thank you very much, Samuel. And now I'd like to invite on stage His Excellency Marc Amenso, Ambassador of France, to give his keynote speech on Singapore, driving ASEAN in uncertain times. Please welcome His Excellency Mr. Marc Abenso. Your Excellency, please. Mr. Xavier Durand, uh, Group CEO of the COFAS, Mr. Samuel Jesus Radnam, Singapore Manager of COFAS. Ladies and gentlemen, it's um, a great pleasure for me to be here with you uh, today, and uh, I wanted to express my thanks to the COFAS to give me this uh, opportunity to share uh, some thoughts uh, with you. So. Uh, as you see, uh, the topic is uh, Singapore driving ASEAN in uncertain times. Um, I think that it would be inappropriate, of course, for me, I mean, to uh, speak on the behalf of the Singaporean authorities. Uh, but uh, at the same time, I mean, I can share with you some elements about France and Singapore uh, relationship, uh, also the EU and ASEAN uh, relationship, and uh, in uh, this context of uncertain uh, times. And I think uh, uncertain times, it's uh, accurate uh, wording um, because, I mean, uh, France, Singapore, uh, the EU, Southeast Asia, we all face global challenges. Uh, population, our populations are aging. Global growth uh, has been uh, subdued. Global productivity growth has been sluggish. Um, at the same time, I mean, we are confronted, all of us, with uh, technical uh, changes. Uh, also, we uh, see that the innovation circles, cycles are uh, shortened, and uh, there is a lot uh, going on on artificial intelligence, uh, robotics programs, which could also displace routine jobs in service and uh, manufacturing. Uh, we also observe, I mean, that workers uh, have to constantly be uh, retrained and upgrade themselves to remain uh, relevant. And uh, in this context, we also uh, see a, a worrying uh, rise of uh, populism, of uh, protectionism, and the fact that uh, the institutional, uh, uh, the multilateral institutions, those who were set up uh, in Bretton Woods, are more and more uh, discussed, even uh, criticized. And uh, so it's uh, important that in this context where we see uh, the increasing influence of some uh, great powers with this perspective of creating uh, in the long run a new sphere of influence that uh, France and Singapore, Europe and uh, Southeast Asia uh, gather together their efforts to preserve uh, these uh, multilateral uh, institutions 
uh, I think that uh, France and Singapore have a shared commitment to uh, a rule-based order, uh, to the rule of law, uh, to uh, multilateral, multilateralism, pragmatic approach to multilateralism, and also to a free and a fair trade. And uh, in uh, such uh, an environment, uh, France and Singapore share uh, these uh, common uh, values. So we are also two countries uh, which are counting on scientific and technological uh, excellence. Uh, we want to adapt our educational uh, structures and vocational training. And uh, we think that innovation uh, must be used to achieve this objective also of social cohesion. So this idea that there is a model of innovation that both France and Singapore want to foster together, which is that on one hand, uh, we want to invest on disrupting technologies, but on the other hand, we are fully aware that we should be also promoting a responsible and inclusive approach on innovation so that at the end there is no uh, left uh, behind. And I think that Singapore is uh, a brilliant uh, example uh, on this approach. If you take this uh, uh, smart city uh, program, I mean, there is always this concern to uh, be uh, at, with the purpose of remaining, I mean, inclusive and for the service of social uh, cohesion. Um, and this is with this in mind that you may remember that when the uh, former French president uh, paid a visit to Singapore uh, last March, that uh, both uh, the French president and Prime Minister Li Xianlong uh, adopted uh, for 2018 uh, the program of having an innovation year, joint innovation year between France and Singapore, uh, which uh, would contribute to uh, increase uh, exchanges between our two ecosystems, uh, also to contribute to build a continuum between academia, research, uh, uh, companies, entrepreneurs, and also uh, which will promote attractiveness for both uh, France and Singapore, ASEAN and, and the EU. And uh, at this, uh, uh, on the, the joint declaration which was adopted by the, the French president and the Singaporean prime minister, there is few key areas which has been identified uh, as the areas where we want to make efforts together. That includes uh, smart city, uh, fintech, health, aging and biotech, aerospace, advanced manufacturing and startups and emerging technologies. And I'm sure that this year of innovation between France and Singapore uh, will also coincide with some priorities of uh, Singapore chairmanship of the ASEAN. Um, as you know, ASEAN is very uh, different uh, from the EU. Uh, ASEAN works on the basis of consensus. Uh, there are different countries with different uh, priorities and interests. But clearly, uh, as a small and open economy, Singapore uh, has always been a promoter of free trade. It is clearly in Singapore's DNA. And so uh, we can reasonably expect that during uh, its uh, chairmanship of the ASEAN, Singapore will keep pushing forward for this agenda. And, uh, and uh, with something also that France and uh, the rest of the EU uh, will also uh, contribute to push uh, forward. Um, we can also, in terms of economic priorities, that uh, expect that Singapore, during uh, its uh, ASEAN uh, chairmanship, uh, will uh, put a large focus on uh, e-commerce and uh, the digital economy. Um, Singapore will uh, make use of its chairmanship to try to streamline regional trade uh, rules governing e-commerce, uh, improving also digital uh, connectivity in the region, and lower uh, operational barriers to entry and especially towards uh, SMEs. We uh, also uh, can expect that Singapore will uh, put a, a focus on helping ASEAN business uh, to lower the administrative cost uh, of trade and for instance uh, by expediting customs clearance uh, via electronic exchange of information across borders and by setting up a self-certification regime. And another area where we could expect also Singapore to um, 
push uh, the agenda forward. It's on big trade agreements. So we all uh, noted, I mean, the US decision to pull out from the TPP. Uh, there are discussion uh, at the moment on the possibility to have a, a TPP uh, at 11, but also uh, there is uh, other initiatives going on, uh, the one on RECEP, and uh, before the end of uh, 2018, uh, there could be also some uh, positive development on, on RECEP. That could be also an objective for uh, Singapore uh, chairmanship. Uh, of course, the RECEP is uh, less ambition uh, than the TPP in the sense that uh, it doesn't de tackle, I mean, the issues related to social and uh, environmental uh, safeguards uh, on opening up of our procurement markets on uh, property, uh, intellectual property also uh, uh, provisions. But nevertheless, I mean, should there be a decision by uh, the end of 2018 to have a RECEP concluded, that would be a strong demonstration of the capacity uh, for Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia to pursue, I mean, the trade liberalization uh, agenda. On EU uh, ASEAN uh, agenda, um, let me say that first, uh, I mean, clearly uh, the ASEAN agenda and the EU agenda are fully in line on some key uh, objectives and that we hope very much I mean, that uh, Ch Singapore can contribute to uh, strengthen uh, the uh, uh, structural partnership between the EU and ASEAN. Um, let me uh, just mention that uh, there are some FTAs uh, between uh, Singapore and the EU uh, still under discussion and that uh, France is really uh, uh, very supportive to this uh, possibility to conclude uh, the uh, Singapore-EU FTA uh, by uh, next year and, or early next year. Uh, there are also other FTAs uh, which are uh, negotiated at the moment uh, between EU and the Philippines, EU and Malaysia, uh, Indonesia as well. And these different FTAs are uh, building blocks uh, towards uh, uh, EU ASEAN uh, FTA which could be adopted in the uh, mid uh, long term. And, uh, and clearly that would demonstrate uh, how the EU and ASEAN are a strategic partnership on the, the trade uh, agenda. Uh, there are also uh, some other uh, areas under discussion. Uh, one which is really important, it's on uh, transport, uh, on transportation. There are uh, some negotiations going on on uh, aviation agreement uh, between the EU and ASEAN and uh, the EU is directly uh, involved uh, with this perspective of concluding it by the end of next year. So as you know, there are aviation agreements uh, uh, between, on the bilateral between, basis between EU and ASEAN countries, but it's extremely I mean, difficult, of course, to deal with uh, 37 different uh, countries. And so since uh, 2016, the EU Commission and ASEAN has started uh, negotiating uh, an agreement and Singapore is uh, playing an uh, instrumental role in that uh, perspective. And of course, that would uh, facilitate, I mean, the opening of new airline routes uh, between the two uh, blocks and uh, also would put both the EU and ASEAN on an equal footing to compete with the Middle East uh, aviation hubs. If you allow me, uh, I would like, uh, just before my concluding remarks, I mean, say, a uh, few things about the transformation agenda uh, taking place uh, in France. Um, so as you know, Europe uh, also is experiencing uh, uncertain times. Uh, so you noted, uh, of course, the Brexit vote, uh, the rise of populist uh, movements uh, in some uh, EU uh, member states, uh, the independent uh, movement in Catalonia at the moment. And in this current context, I mean, French people, uh, chose to elect uh, last May a, a new young uh, president uh, on a pro-European and a pro-reform uh, platform. And so what I wanted to share with you is uh, what has happened uh, since then. There is a strong, strong political back, uh, backing for the French uh, president and the, uh, the reforms are already uh, gradually implemented. 
Uh, if you take uh, one which was uh, the pivotal reform of the transformation agenda, which is the labor market reform. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, a bill has been adopted to uh, uh, adopt the, um, the labor law uh, market to make the labor law uh, more flexible. And, and now you have a negotiation uh, between trade unions and enterprises. So it's at the enterprises level instead of being engaged in a negotiation process at national level. So that creates more flexibility for the social dialogue. Uh, recruitment is easier, so the purpose is to create uh, new jobs, and in particular uh, for SMEs. And you have, I would say, uh, a conceptual shift uh, in terms of the fact that the focus before was on how to preserve jobs, and now you have this idea that you preserve, I mean, personal security uh, of, of the individual, and uh, with this idea that that would contribute to create uh, more jobs in the future. There are also some uh, pro-business uh, reforms uh, taking place uh, at the moment. Uh, the decision has been made to decrease the tax pressure on business and investor, and so the corporate tax uh, will be gradually uh, decreased from 33% to 25% over the next uh, five years, and this will bring our tax rate, uh, co corporate tax rate, in line with the other European uh, uh, member states. We have also introduced a flat tax at 30% on gains made on savings and, uh, and financial uh, revenues, and uh, this also will contribute to invest more in the productive uh, economy. And let me also mention the transformation of the wealth tax into uh, now a property tax, so based only on uh, uh, expensive real estate. And so all these different uh, measures uh, aim at attracting more foreign investment, and, uh, and the, the, the government is clearly committed, I mean, to uh, maintain stability in, in the tax system. Uh, in parallel, also, there are some efforts made to uh, improve our public finances. So you know that uh, the uh, public spending in France uh, was among the highest uh, within the EU. Uh, and so now there is clearly the decision, I mean, to reduce public spending. And uh, for the first time uh, over the last uh, 10 years, the uh, fiscal deficit target of being uh, uh, beneath the 3% uh, will be reached uh, by the end of uh, this year. Uh, last but not least, also uh, the government uh, is, uh, has uh, defined I mean, investment on education and innovation as uh, the key priorities. So let me just mention on innovation that there will be a, a special fund of 10 billion euros which will be set up for research on uh, uh, disruptive uh, technologies. And with this idea that in the future, we would also create with some uh, other EU members uh, the equivalent of the DARPA, uh, the US DARPA, but uh, for, uh, uh, for European countries. And uh, also uh, for the investment plan of 57 billion, uh, clearly, innovation and education are the two uh, key pillars. So, as you, you see, there is a, a tough uh, reform uh, agenda. Uh, it's uh, getting implemented uh, at a rather fast uh, pace. And, uh, and clearly, uh, this, uh, uh, we will benefit I mean, from this uh, solid economic uh, momentum. So, now it's also the time to scale up our collective ambition for the Eurozone. So I won't uh, get into uh, details, but uh, you have probably witnessed, I mean, some debates about uh, the perspective of having a future uh, Eurozone budget, uh, a future Eurozone parliament to control it, and also a, a future Eurozone uh, finance uh, minister. And, and clearly the, the Eurozone uh, would be key for the uh, greater integration uh, of uh, euro and guaranteeing financial uh, stability and growth uh, prospect. So with this very robust uh, political and economic uh, momentum, I think that France is, uh, is ready, is in a better position now to, to uh, deliver on reforms and show leadership in these uncertain times in, in Europe. Uh, I think that Singapore 
uh, can also uh, play that role in, in Asia, and especially during this uh, its, uh, ASEAN chairmanship. Uh, and so you have uh, clearly uh, a responsibility for both France and Singapore also to take the lead in this uh, initiative. Thank you very much for your attention.